James Concannon was born on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day, in 1847, on the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland. He was born into a large Catholic family, and on this rocky, windswept island, James grew up, helped his family work the land, and got his education in the head school. James may have had humble beginnings, but he was an ambitious young man, and at 18, like so many before him, he left the Aran Islands and Ireland to seek his fortune in America. In Augusta, Maine, he worked his way up to become a hotel manager, and it was here he met and married Ellen Rowe, an Irish girl from Kilkenny. In 1875, the couple, with their baby girl May, ventured west. They came to the bustling city of San Francisco and settled in the mostly Irish Mission District. James got a job with a local bookseller, Anton Roman, who published writers such as Bret Hart. Then he got a franchise with the Sheplar Rubber Stamp Company, and as rubber stamps were extremely popular at the time, there was significant money to be made. James travelled up and down the west coast, extending his territory north from the Canadian border down south into Mexico, where he also learned Spanish. He and Ellen and their growing family were doing well in their new life. The first Archbishop of San Francisco uh, was Archbishop Alamany, and so he uh, would dine with him periodically, and he mentioned the fact that, uh, that it would be a good idea that maybe to progress that he would go into the, you know, the wine business and make wine for the Catholic, Lutheran, and Episcopalians. And the grandfather said, what, an Irishman, you know, making wine? <laughs> you know, that's uncalled for. But he said it was you know, not a matter of nationality, ma a matter of application in life. James took the archbishop's advice and in 1883 went out to Livermore Valley where he bought a small parcel of 47 acres. He built a new home for Ellen and their now four children and began to establish his vineyard. The gravel soil of Livermore Valley was similar to parts of Bordeaux and the Rhone in France and so was perfect for growing vines. James also made sure that his new venture had the best possible start as it was from France he and some of his neighbours sourced the first cuttings. He made his first wine in the family uh, wine cellar which is the family home which is right next door here. The vines seemed to really uh, uh, root well and not get high production, but quality and consistency. Not be uh, large, but to be good. But while the vineyard was getting up and running, James still needed an income. So the enterprising Irishman worked on his earlier connections in Mexico to convince the Mexican president, Porfirio Diaz, of the opportunity to produce wine commercially on Mexican soil. James was granted a concession to establish vineyards and supplied cuttings from Livermore to haciendas across the country. It was a very unique distribution system and, and Diaz gave him, for whatever reason, an honor guard to take him from one hacienda to the next. It wasn't so much for protection, it was more of the fact maybe to impress these to, the, uh, to these landowners that, you know, let's get this thing going. With Diaz's backing, James set the Mexican wine industry on its feet. From 1888 to 1904, cuttings were sent from Livermore to Mexico. By 1893, over one million cuttings were leaving Livermore in a season for various haciendas in Mexico. It's said that James produced pamphlets in Spanish to instruct the Mexican landowners on how to grow and treat their vines. However, the fruits of the work that James began in Mexico didn't survive. Mexico was not an equal society and revolution was in the wind. Corruption and greed among the ruling class brought about their downfall and with the revolution most of the vineyards were destroyed. James returned to Livermore to concentrate on his growing business and his growing family of ten children. Family and heritage were important to James Concannon. His love for Ireland and his native language too was part of who he was and he proved this during one visit home. He was recorded attending the Islands Gaelic League meeting where he passionately told the gathering that an Irishman who speaks only English cannot fairly or correctly call himself by that fine holy name because he does not earn it. He, he went back four times but the last time he had these major strokes and the doctor said this will kill you and he said I don't care he says I'm going back with my oldest daughter May 
and see my uh, uh, home land for the last time. During that visit, James is reported to have remarked to May as they walked around the island, there can be no prosperity in a land ruled by aliens. Not long after he returned from his trip, James died on the 6th of February 1911. He was 63 years old. His funeral was one of the largest seen in Livermore, and he was buried in this Californian valley. You know, in life, you know, we're big on family, God, and country, and uh, to take care of your family. And you know how that family expanded eventually. So he had to move and do things, and either he had to or he didn't. Some people wouldn't face life, but he did. Instilling that uh, togetherness and focusing and getting the job done and moving on and respect for people. He just tried to do his best, I guess. That was it. And that, that's about all uh, he could say you know, today, 159 years later. James Concannon's legacy to his family and to Livermore still lives on today. Livermore is still a thriving wine valley, progressed by hard-working families. What sets James apart is that the vines he planted in 1883 and the wines he produced have flourished for over 125 years, making Concannon one of California's longest-lived vineyards. Today, the vineyard continues to produce award-winning wines, and James Concannon's vision of a world-class estate vineyard will continue for years to come.